I suppose. I mean, I I can just. Uh, it's funny. I'm obviously. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, whatever. Let's just do it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I delayed long enough to annoy myself, and then... And like, oh, oh, never mind. Uh, Starting is hard. It Starting is. is very hard, Rob. Yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, do you have... Do you, are you going to play the music, or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, I'll, cool. I'll do the intro piece. All but right. this is like where we, get, where we roll in after the music. You know, a lot of people... <laughs> We're starting. Uh, a lot of people don't get to hear that. They don't get to hear all the the clumsy. Uh, what do we? What, how do we? How do we kick this thing off? Oh, hi! Welcome to blah blah blah. Right? Um, all the talking. Sure, it's, it's all the perfectly clean branded stuff, right? You're supposed no. to be on topic, on message, and uh, and it's or, a good thing to shoot for. I mean, or or the other thing is is what some people do is they'll like just be riffing and riffing, and then they'll just kind of find when they're in the editing stage they'll find the perfect place to cut in they'll fade in with them talking about something else so they'll cut mm -hmm. in with them like it, it, finishing up another thought and that's always an interesting place to start right it is yeah and medias res right What's in the that? middle of in the middle of things or in the middle yeah. of the action yeah yeah good storytelling uh, like you just walked approach. into the cafe and there's these two erudite fellows conversing you know it's tolkien and c.s lewis talking about literature <laughs> And you just walked in, and you're sitting, you're listening in over their shoulders. That's, that, mm. hey, I mean, this is meta stuff, you know? It's like, but that, that's something to think about in the way you present yourself, and the way you present your materials, because um, it's a balance, you know? I mean, this is something that I, I struggle with a lot, is like, is it better to kick off with, hi, welcome to such and such, this is the show where we do such and such, and I'm such and such, and this is so and so, uh, and then start talking, because that's a clumsy way to do it, too, because then it, it's this canned, prepackaged kind of introduction. Sure. Um, and it can be very forced. I mean, it's like a, a, a sitcom that uses up the first few minutes of of the uh, the showtime with the, the blunt end of the premise, as, as I think Strong Bad put it, right? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Which is why he doesn't have an actual intro. Or last time on Lead Into Art. Exactly. <laughs> Some of those techniques are, are fun. Yeah. I mean, they're devices, right? I mean, but hopefully they're not traps. Uh, right. Where, I mean, if, if, I guess if we were in, a, in thick and heavy on some kind of really cool topic that we would then, you know what, you wouldn't enjoy this part of the conversation if we didn't hook it to the prior one a little bit and give it some yeah. premise or some, some introduction. That makes a lot of sense. But then to just do it. Yeah. Hmm. You know, I, I think about... I think about this too, like uh, this, I'm, I'm working very slowly on a video project with some people and uh, one of the things I'm toying around with as an idea is like the, the big idea is, is to try to teach or demonstrate key visual storytelling principles, specifically comics principles mm -hmm. um, through a fictional narrative. And one of the things that I was trying to find a way to hook in the learning experience, like encapsulate it in, a, in like 60 seconds at the end, is like follow a bunch of different TV sort of, um, I don't want to say TV tropes because I think of TV tropes.com. Um, but like, you know, like the end of Mork and Mindy with when Mork talks to Orson about what he learned. The end oh. of the Wonder Years where Kevin or whatever the character's name uh, turns to the camera and like there's like it's like there's a slow pan while the narrator talks about what he learned that day. But playing on that idea. I mean that's maybe that's something we can play around with with this is like this idea that like we do a whole bunch of different TV kind of things where we do like a theme song, we get the perfect strangers theme, and then it kicks into the episode. Or we do previously on Lead into Art or you know, bar borrowing those kind of ideas to bring oh, yeah. people up to speed. Being playful with it. Being playful is important, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, well, and rules actually can help play. So you can have a format that actually, uh, by stretching and uh, playing with the the format as a premise, then you you are engaging in some kind of play with it, right? So maybe the previously uh, you you got me. Oh, that's the Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> previously yeah. on Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, Krillin was tying his shoe. It was, you know, it's more, <laughs> he was about to die. <laughs> and, uh, but, but was, uh, they, they are, um, I guess they can get tired, but yeah. I guess that's just formats. You, you have to keep the pattern interesting somehow, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, speaking about getting meta, uh, every time I start Skype, it messes with my system volume. So I run too hot on my mic. So I'm going to tweak that real quick. Okay. So, 
Uh, so that's extra fun. <laughs> so uh, uh, not meta. We, we should make some noise about appearances. We're going to be appearing publicly. I mean, we're appearing publicly now with this video. We, we, for people who are listening to the podcast after the fact, if you're just getting this through iTunes... Uh, thanks for subscribing, first of all. But second of all, um, we're also we're still playing around with formats, and uh, this time we're recording a video entirely through Skype. That's so right. You can watch our heads and watch my face contort and watch my head bobble uh, as I talk. Uh, you can you can you can compare and contrast uh, Rob's very pleasant and calm way of presenting versus my manic and like I'm I'm going to choke on my own words if I don't slow down form of pre presenting. <laughs> um, I suppose, yeah, I, I could probably balance a book on my head the whole time and I wouldn't notice the difference in my <laughs> performance. <laughs> That's not a good thing, I don't think. Going back to your finishing school days? Yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. Those are tough days. So where are you going to be? Um, be in so a couple let's weeks? See, I'll be at uh, Intervention uh, the, let's see, next weekend. That's uh, starting on, what, uh, Friday the 15th, I believe. And, uh, but that's actually coming up after your, your appearance, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be, Where are you going to be, Jersey? Well, but first we should say interventioncon.com, correct? If I'm not mistaken. Interventioncon.com. And, uh, it's essentially the, the, they call it your online life in person. Uh, and there's just going to be a ton of different web comics people there. And, uh, people of various, various geeky interests. And, uh, There'll be uh, folks at tables selling you cool stuff, and also uh, you know people doing some some uh, panels and talks and stuff too. Lots and lots of programming. That programming list is absurd. There is so much stuff going on that weekend. Man, yeah, the, the whole programming site. I mean, seeing it all come together too. There was just an avalanche of ideas that were out there. So I mean, it's neat. The, the, I, this will be my first intervention. I mean, but to have that kind of pile of programming, there must be a lot of. Uh, um, excited people about the event, you know? Yeah, for sure. Good. Oh my gosh. So yeah, you're going to be presenting there. And, oh yeah. <clears throat> oh, who me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll be doing a, a presentation on, uh, um, uh, using, uh, storytelling, um, storytelling to make your comic UI awesome. So the idea is that yes, yeah, storytellers, uh, you have skills right now that actually will help you do UI design for your interactive comic. Because designing a website for your comic is one of the hardest parts. It's one of the parts that people bemoan the most. Who At least those who are coming at it from the, the standpoint of visual storyteller first, right? I worked hard to learn all this drawing stuff, all this anatomy, perspective, storytelling moments, finding my beats. Oh, I gotta make a website too? I'm just gonna call my cousin in Peoria. He'll do it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And, and, uh, hey, you know, no, no guarantees. I mean, you chances are you won't get injured doing it. I think it's worth giving a shot, but I think you'll, you'll, uh, just get connected with stuff you already know to know that, uh, whatever you end up choosing to do with it, you'll have, um, uh, uh, a good flow about, you know, who you're reaching with your, your comic and what kind of elements do you want to put on the page? You know, what would it be, what's worth taking away and what's worth adding? And I, I think that's, that answer is different for everyone. What's cool is you can come up with your own. And, um, that's, uh, that's being a UI designer and your, your storytelling experience through, uh, conveying the, uh, flow of information over time and, and how you're, you're used to, uh, you're, you're used to speaking to a specific audience. Well, you, you you pulled it off once already, right? You put it on those ideas on the on the on your comic page. Uh, you can go through a pretty similar process to actually pull that off with how that comic is distributed as yeah. well. And I mean, a, another layer to this that is more of a practical end is that as somebody who's been doing web comics since two thousand three, uh, I took it upon myself to just learn how to do this stuff because I didn't want to have to count on somebody. I started out counting on somebody, and I mean, it's when you're asking somebody to do stuff for you for free, uh, they're not going to be as available as you want them to be. And, and and this is an old old piece of advice: nobody cares about your comic as much as you do. So getting somebody else to do it your way is going to be ex exceedingly difficult unless you're paying them. So uh, why not take that time? 
that you would normally, I mean, this is, this is all about like allocation of resources and allocation of value is like, if I'm going to pay somebody else to do it, why not just use that money to pay myself to learn how to do it so I can do it the way I want it to is to the best of my ability. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, uh, by getting more in touch with that and getting some, some experience with it, uh, you will, even if you do end up hiring it out at some point, you will be in a be better position to dialogue with whoever is occupying that role. Um, and then, but at, you know, very likely you wouldn't actually have to hand that off, especially if you're being an independent creator operating on a pretty tight budget, like most of us independent creators are. So, yeah. Realized I have like a vacuum cleaner and a fan and a stool behind me. I was I was setting this up for screen printing behind me, which is my segue to talk about my appearance. But yeah, I should have oh. I should have picked that up before I, before we start recording video. That's not tidy. Um, yes, so I was up late getting ready with these guys, which uh, you'll see on the video if you're watching the video. If you're listening to the audio podcast, you'll just have to imagine in your head a couple of screen printed mini comics that I'm going to be debuting at SPX, the Small Press Expo. Uh, September 10th and 11th, 2011. Yes, I was up late doing a two-color print of Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire. Can you even see that? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, that. it comes up. I mean, it's great contrast. I mean, I see the yeah. uh, yep. sweet-looking bird comic. bear on the cover of that thing. Eight-page mini-comic. I've never done a full, uh, you know, screen-printed treatment on this guy. Uh, I've, I've made a whole bunch of little paper uh, mini comic versions that I've just been given away at shows and stuff, but never like with like the nice cardstock cover and then the, the fancy printed cover. And then also I, I just realized I never took this, I, this has been done for almost a year, but I never taken it to a show before eight scary things by Jared, which is based on my little Jared Cran comic series that I was doing uh, and can hope to continue to update. But, um, this one's kind of a pain in the butt to put together because, uh, I get the interiors printed through Kinko's. Uh, in full color, but they can't print to the edge of the page. So I actually have to trim like about an eighth of an inch around the whole exterior of the pages and then nest it uh. just right into the paper or the cardstock cover. And I have to use binder clips to hold it into place. Well, so it, it, it takes a long time to bind them all. So I'm going to have a short run of uh, only 20 copies at SPX. That's SPXbow.com. Uh, for those who are actually interested in uh, me capturing, like one of the things I like to do when I go to shows especially when I'm just there as a, a, you know, a guest or attendee is like try to capture as much of the experience as possible and just share it. Cause I mean, I got this mobile production studio in my pocket called an iPhone. So I, like you know, I just want to say you are really good at that too. It's uh, you do like a sort of like a, as you go journalism of, of the event. I mean, it's your experience too, but like, yeah, man, I just do not pull my phone out of my pocket that often. And, and uh, so I always like seeing those streams, like when you're reporting live, you know, from the event and just, doing fun stuff or just sharing a photo here and there. It's funny that you use the word journalism. Somebody said that to me recently is that I run the risk of becoming a comics journalist and that's totally not my intent. My intent is just sort of mm. like let everybody in on the experience if possible because I'm not there to like do a, a man on the street interview. Like I'm here with so and so and I want to talk to you about your book. Tell me about your story. You know, I don't want to do that. I just want to like so many interesting conversations happen at these mm. kinds of events that I just want to grab as much of that as I can so that everybody gets to participate in it if they want to. Uh, but I'll tell you, pulling that phone out of the pocket and stick it in somebody's face is not always the most comfortable thing to do in the entire world, especially <laughs> when I'm not there as a journalist. If I was there with my, you know, my uh, fedora with the little piece of paper that said press on it, uh, that'd be a different thing altogether. But so many people get uncomfortable having a recording device in front of their face. And then when I say, no, 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 just keep talking about what you're talking about. I just wanted to grab some of this because I think it was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, because it, when you are in front of a mic, you want to put on your presentation face. You want to put on like, oh, I got I to gotta make the pitch. No, I don't want you to make the pitch. You just said something really interesting about tribes just now. And I want to grab that because I think other people should hear this interesting thing you said. Uh, so I did this at Kids Read Comics 2010. Um, I was at like one of the after parties and I was just, every time somebody started talking about something interesting, I'm like, ah, I could get out my phone and start recording. And I remember somebody said to me, a friend of mine actually said like, geez, Jerry's punch out. I'm like, well, it's not, <laughs> it's not punching out or punching in. It's like, this is still interesting stuff. So, uh, I'm going to grab as much of this as I can, but I don't want to spam up the Twitter feeds or the Facebook feeds or whatever, whoever, wherever you're following me, if you are, uh, by the way, I'm Jersey on Twitter and comics are great on Facebook. Um, but I'm going to put it, uh, I talked with Casey Van Heis, who I'm going to be tabling with. Of, uh, she's of winters and Lavelle.com. 
and uh, we talked about like how to do this in a tasteful way uh, for the people who actually care about this stuff. So we're going to just dump it all into a single Tumblr page or Tumblr blog just for this event. And it's called uh, enjoyingfatunicorns.tumblr.com. <laughs> When Enjoying Fat Unicorns, where did that provocative title come from? <laughs> you want the full story? I got an anecdote. Um, because it sounds totally memeish, doesn't it? And it's like, I, I really got a, a mixed, uh, mixed feelings about memes, which we could table for another discussion later okay. date. But um, the, the whole genesis, this whole unicorns thing came out of, I was teaching at a high school, which was joined with an elementary school. And I, um, in order to get to, I had like a mailbox where I had to get my teaching materials, uh, or not teaching materials, but like, like, you know, updates on things going on at the school that I needed to know as an instructor there. And as I was going through the hallway, I had to pass by the third grade classroom on the way there. And as I'm walking through, there's this little girl, uh, what, what's third grade? Like 10? No, it's like nine or eight, nine, something like eight. I think. Nine or eight or nine. It's like the yeah, transition between those. Yeah, eight. somewhere in the neighborhood. She's walking in the hall in front of me. She's got a little pink backpack and written on the back of the backpack in glittery letters is just the word unicorns. And it was the first time in my life, like I, you know, I'm nostalgic. I love all like the cartoons in my youth, but this is the first time I ever had a feeling of the real nostalgia where it felt painful. Like, oh, this is a time I can never have back where this little girl just put on her backpack unicorns because she thinks unicorns are really great. Not in an ironic way, not in the kind of campy or silly tongue-in-cheek way. She just thinks unicorns are boss, and she wants to proclaim it to the world. And I thought, what a wonderful time eight years old is. I, I remember very distinctly what eight felt like, and I can't have that back, and it hurt a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> And and, uh, and 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 plus it was just it was just so so like triumphant in the way it was like unicorns yes of course so um, I I just decided that I wanted to get in touch with that like more in in my my own life feel that way as much as I could and I wanted to use that as my proclamation like yes unicorns like we should be able to say that word without feeling self conscious about it right and like that it became my badge to represent that entire feeling of being eight years old well little did i know that uh the unicorn thing was in full swing on the internet in terms of like what is it robot unicorns or something like that like there's a whole bunch of like different <clears throat> ironic iterations of unicorns less ironic iterations sure. i think there's an adult swim game actually robot unicorn attack Okay, yeah, and that, and there's less ironic versions. Like I've been uh, assured that the t cartoon series Adventure Time, which I need to watch, uh, plays unicorns totally straight, and it's played mm -hmm. in that eight-year-old way. And they and I've been told by countless people that I will really love that show if I ever get, find the time to watch it, and I'm sure I will. But uh, so anyway, you know, it, it kind of spiraled out of that. It's not me trying to jump on any kind of meme stuff. It was more of like uh, an unfortunate confluence of memes and. Uh, 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 happening upon a, a, a backpack that made me made my heart ache <laughs> observing i mean it's yeah it's just a genuine love i mean i think the uh um your your inspiration is uh that that an eight-year-old girl uh triggered that and your response to it the thing is you're you know obviously in a position to you know maybe overthink it where i don't think she's really overthinking her backpack no <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's exactly just what I wanted to it. grab onto, you know, is that, that feeling of not overthinking it. of just like, this is neat, you know? Yeah. Um, um, anyway, I just, I, I always feel kind of obliged to go into that story just to explain like, no, 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 I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to speak to teenagers here. I'm not trying to be hip and with it. It's just, this is me being a dumb grown up who really wishes he could be. I, I, I had a conversation with a friend. We were at, um, Wizard World Chicago, and we were looking at a display of G.I. Joe figures that were on the card from like 1983, Ooh. and we were just, we were wrapped. We were, we were transported to that experience of walking through the toy aisles when we were little kids, and I turned to him, and you know, we were both kind of breathless looking at like Destro on the card, and I said, like, we're not going to be happy until we can go back to that, are we? And he's like, no, you know, it's never going to be that good, and we're never going to enjoy life as much as we did then. I'm like, oh, that's terrible! <laughs> 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 you can't unknow what you know. <laughs> anyway, so um, we should get to talking about uh, art, uh, not talking about unicorns. No, it was cool. So yeah, we we both have some uh, uh, public appearances going on, and yep. that, that is awesome. I mean, in addition to this video podcast, which obviously it's you know a little redundant. <laughs> welcome if you're here. If you're not, bring your or you know, uh, if you're not here, then hope you 
find us at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this reaches you through the internet channel. Well, we, we could say, like, if, if somebody's not here and you are here, you should tell the yeah. person who's not here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's simpler. Um, so, uh, you ready to lean into it? You got you got, you wanted to throw me a curveball today, and I'm, yeah, I'm excited. I'm stoked to give you this curveball. It's like you just said, all right, let's get to the topic. I'm like, yes. Okay. You ready? All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's funny is that this totally ties into a lot of what, what you were talking about uh, as far as, you know, making things with, uh, you know, the you, custom comic covers and whatever, because I mean, this can take so many different directions, um, like, like many questions can. I'm really curious, when you go to start a creative project, Jersey, just what, what is your process when you know you're going to, you know you're, you're going to do it, and let's say it's, um, and we can go with different flavors of this question, where I'm curious if, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's the same, whether if it's a, uh, uh, a client, or if it's just something that you committed to, right? What happens when you start a creative project for you? Ooh, that is a curveball. How, how do you encapsulate that? I mean, I don't have this uh, ironed out into a bullet-pointed list. Um, and probably the more interesting place to go for me would be to talk about how the thinking process works rather than what the procedure of actual... Well, first, I take a piece of paper and I break out my moleskin and, you know... Um, although lately, lately, uh, I'll tell you, Evernote has been my be very best friend in terms of capturing this stuff. Because the thing is, is like a lot of this stuff... Um, a lot of my writing happens just in my brain. It doesn't happen on the page. I don't just like do sloppy writing and just jot down a bunch of random things. Um, a lot of it comes out of um, really crunching on an idea, crunching on it. If it doesn't go anywhere, I just let it sit in the back of my brain and then the inspiration will hit wherever I am. I'll be shopping for cabbages and all of a sudden, bing, oh, I got to grab that. And uh, I don't always have a notepad on me, so but I always have my phone on me. And so my Evernote actually has a series of ongoing notes for different projects that I inevitably will get to. Um, and I grab those ideas and put them there. Like I have one right now called, um, it has no title, it's just called Robot Story. And because I have a dream of doing a story where I can incorporate giant robots in a new way, in an original way, you know, uh, because I love Transformers, but I don't want to just redo Transformers. I don't want to just do... Uh, a variation on Voltron. I don't want to do a variation on Shogun Warriors. I want to find a way to capture my love of great big giant robots in a way that I've never seen before that plays to my eight-year-old self, right? And so I started a, a, a note in Evernote called Robot Story, and whenever an idea occurs to me of something to consider, I put it in there. And some of those things are ideas, like... I'll just I'll, I, these aren't in the note. I'm just going to throw out like random things like uh, mm -hmm. jungle planet, uh, post apocalyptic Earth, right? I'll throw out like here's some ideas for settings. Uh, sometimes it'll be questions. Sometimes it'll be like, is it important that the main character is a girl or a boy? If so, why? I'll start a dialogue with myself and I'll start making choices that way. Um, but really, uh, it, now other times there'll be like ideas for character designs. Like, oh, think of this this character plus that character, but a cowboy. You know, it'd be like that kind of idea. So, like, I'll I'll capture a whole bunch of just random thoughts, dialogue with myself in Evernote, and then I'll go back and review them every once in a while when some new ideas strike me, and I'll see, kind of do a review session to see how it's all adding up, and if if there's any kind of like if I've gone down a divergent path, and then I'll even like say forget this. I'll leave it in the note, but I'll say forget this idea for now. I'll, but I'll leave it in because I never know if I'm going to get back to it. If, like maybe three weeks from now, that'll be inspiring again. So first idea is capture everything that I can in the form of a dialogue, but don't restrict myself to doing it at the desk. Do it everywhere, right? Um, can I just mention, the, can I, I want to highlight a couple things on what I heard so far. Um, I what you explained to me, it, it's interesting how uh, there really aren't hard edges in starting. Yeah. There's just sort of like a need and then responding to the need as far as creating, yeah. right? And uh, uh, it sounds like you just, you have tools and things that work for you that you are, you know, you're capturing your ideas and growing them and whatnot. But then the, uh, um, 
it's interesting that, well, what is really starting then, right? So mm-hmm. this could be the incubate. It's really, I think it's up to anyone. Like you could define it however you want uh, as far as uh, is this incubating projects or is this the, you know, the development and planning phase or whatever you call it. But it's definitely not like a hard line. Like you were one time starting it is when you first captured a note, whatever, right? Yeah. But maybe... Um, when when does it become when is there a threshold there for you like when you when you go from that initial phase into more production or development I was, I was streaming um online I, I i occasionally when i have time will do live streaming of drawing I'm working on something or if i'm doing some more up sketches i'll stream it and I was doing some very smooth lines on a character. I was practicing with a brush pen, and somebody asked in the chat, um, "How do you get those lines to be so smooth? How do you get like the movement of the character's shoulders to look so smooth?" And I couldn't explain the years and years of practice that went into that in a sentence. But I, what I could say is, they said, "You know, when you're a little kid and you're drawing like a battle scene between a million tanks and a million jets, like we've all done when we're little boys and some little girls." <laughs> And you start making the sound effects like, bow, 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 bow. and like you're just you're in that world. You're watching that you're drawing, but you're watching the drawings move in your head as you're doing it, and you're lost in that kind of zone of like, oh, this is so awesome. I said that is kind of when I started to be able to draw fluid poses when I was able to get myself into that mindset again as an illustrator. So when I'm drawing a person, like I got to draw a guy doing a really awesome action pose. If I can get into that kind of mental zone of when I was when I was a kid doing the pow, pow, pow thing, so when I'm drawing the crossbody punch, I'm actually imagining the sound that it's making as I'm drawing it, then somehow it clicks, and I'm able to capture the, the, the feeling of the, the kinetic energy and everything, right? Now, wh- where am I going with this? This is the same idea of when I know that a, a project idea is baked enough to be able to take it to the next level and turn it into a story. So, like, yeah, there is no hard edges on a story. Because, like, I'm talking earlier about parameters, right? That's, like, one of the big ideas here. It's, like, a, a robot story that is original but, but speaks to what I love about giant robot stories. Um, mm-hmm. that, that's, a, that's a series of limitations that I'm placing on it. Obviously, it, that means that it's not going to be uh, certain things if there's robots in it. Right, it it precludes certain things, although it doesn't necessarily, because it could be about wizards, it could be about talking bears, it could be about you know Smurfs, it could be about anything, and still have robots in it. But they're, they're, putting that one limitation means that it must include this. It's like creating like a smart playlist in iTunes. <laughs> include <laughs> all of the following, right, <laughs> or any of the following, and that that's a totally different way to build a smart playlist. I mean, I wonder if that's an analogy, but um, but on the other hand. Tiny Hamilton, a comic that I do with my wife, uh, about tiny talking meats. That began with Ann and me just drawing one night, and we had a bottle of bourbon, and we weren't getting wasted or anything, but we were just enjoying our bourbon and enjoying drawing, and we were getting a little silly and punchy. And uh, the conversation turned to her fascination with tiny meats. My, my wife, Ann, collects miniature uh, replicas of food like that people use for doll houses like the really expensive doll dioramas so like these meats look like absolutely authentic but they're like what are they like a quarter inch in diameter right so she's got like hams beef uh turkey mashed potatoes broccoli you know we 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 take trips up north to uh frankenmuth michigan because there's a store that actually sells those they have like specialized in like tiny doll house stuff and so she doesn't collect the dolls she doesn't collect the houses or furniture or anything she just wants the foods and so our conversation turned to that, like, gosh, you're a weird person because you enjoy collecting these things so much. What is it about them? And then we got talking about her, like, her philosophy of, like, oh, how it, like, so much our, our uh, craftsmanship goes into these tiny meats. They look so authentic. And she's just fascinated by things that are small and whatnot. And so we have a chalkboard up in our dining room. We have, like, three big chalkboards, like, all configured in our... You've seen them, Rob. I have. And... and, and uh, that that is we have our house is configured to capture ideas everywhere in my office you, if you're watching the video you can see there's a big dry, dry erase board next to me there's a dry erase board next to my art desk there is a chalkboard in our dining room and then there's chalkboards in Ann's office as well so everywhere we are if an idea occurs to us we can grab it and so i just playfully drew a little ham with a face on it and put little stick arms and legs and just wrote tiny hamilton over top of it 
and it was just me making fun of her, like saying, I'm going to write a comic about a little talky beat called Tiny Hamilton. He used to be this cheerful little guy who goes, hey, how's it going? And uh, <laughs> it stayed on the board for a few days, and we kept looking at it, and we'd laugh every time we saw it. Like, even when we weren't, like, all punchy and tired, mm. we'd look at it, and we'd laugh, and suddenly it turned from like yeah we should do that as a comic yeah that'd be funny day two yeah that would make a really funny comic we should totally do it day three yeah we should do it we should do that as a comic you know (laughs) so that's when we knew you know we didn't even have a premise we didn't have a story all we had was this drawing of a funny little ham and it amused us so much that it turned into a thing so you never know i mean this is inspiration right like how do you define that uh well, I I really I think it's uh, it's really individual, but uh, it, I do hear some some concepts like uh, not quite iteration, but there is sort of a uh, an ongoing reflection and, and experiencing of it, where it mm-hmm. it held up to that to that ex- where it was like of a quality, it, it had a something to it that mean that made sense to bring it past that earlier phase. Right. Of of um, working through the concept and you're just playing, right? Right. Um, it's it survived. It's not like it was a perfect checklist of what it had to survive, right? I mean, is is you know, can I can you say Hamilton a thousand times without <laughs> hating it or something, right? I mean, right. It'd be silly. Um, yeah. What would what would be a good test? I, I don't think you could hire Consumer Reports to do that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> And and this is probably one of the reasons that focus groups are always so misleading and not very useful overall, because yeah. uh, you can't measure this and test this. This is this is that lightning in a bottle kind of idea that you just it it happens when it happens. And uh, you know every experience I've ever had with focus groups for any creative projects I've been involved in have been disastrous. It's been it's turned into surface things that ultimately don't mean anything. Uh, it's cursory. It's not really getting at the, what the heart of the thing is. And I think that getting at the heart of what something is happens back here in the back of the brain, right? Mm-hmm. And that only happens through just repetition of looking at it again and again and again until and seeing if it still amuses you, see if it still sticks, see if it still inspires you to come up with more ideas, right? And sure. when I say ideas, I'm not talking about like, like oh, and he could fly a plane. Oh, and he could be in space. Oh, and he could be a spelunker. <laughs> you know, this is yeah. like ideas like, oh, and I could express these kinds of concepts through this. Oh, and I could find this kind of meaning in it, right? Um, I could, I could pr- portray ideas that are important to me through this premise or this character, right? Or I could come up with these amusing scenarios that make me laugh every time I think about it, right? Or sure. cause this kind of emotional response in me. Like, for instance, I just finished thumbnailing uh, the second issue of Tiny Hamilton, and uh, we're starting an arc with it because we have this plan of that we're going to do a series of short stories that we're going to collect as a big book when we're done. And so, if we're going to kick off an arc, then things got to get really bad so they can go on a quest to make things good. That kind of idea. And I wrote this scene where uh, Hamilton and his best friend get into a bar fight because Hamilton is really distraught about something. And like you read the first issue, it's this cute little story about like a uh, kind of an outdoor like picnic Olympics kind of idea. And the second mm-hmm. one is like he's he's heartbroken and he doesn't know how to express it. And his best friend just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and he takes it out on him. And Anne's flipping through it as, as we're co-writing it, and she's like this is really rough stuff, man. You know, so it's not just about like making you chuckle. It's also about like what makes you respond. Right. Um, yeah. And, and that doesn't have to be some, some checklist. It's, uh, somehow it survived, uh, further familiarity and for maybe even further scrutiny where somehow it, 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 it was extendable to fit with what you needed. So like the, maybe it's the, Maybe uh, what's funny is some projects end up addressing a different need than what it initially caused the idea to get captured. Mm-hmm. So Tiny Hamilton got captured at one point based on you know being entertaining, but then it eventually grew into you could tell uh, a, a rich story with it, or ba- it, it, and and that's let's see because of course you could. I mean, you could do it based on. Um, Anything that you come up, can come up with, but you cared about that one in particular, and that's what made it important and worthwhile, right? Right. And, and, and sometimes it's finding, it's, it starts off with just like a silly joke idea that can spiral off into 
deeper ideas, more resonant ideas, or it can spiral off into a system of thinking about ideas to generate more ideas. Like I've heard this, this terminology before called, um, story engine. Have you heard this? Mm. You know, like, like something in built into the way the story is constructed so that it generates more ideas for more stories or generates more ideas for more jokes. Like, for instance, one of the things that we have set up as a rule is that every character that in, in, in interacts with Hamilton, save one, save um, uh, uh, Chuck the Butcher, uh, they have to be a meat of some sort. And that becomes a fun investigation of character types. Like, okay, uh, so they're in a bar, and I wanted to introduce a bartender character. What kind of character is this bartender going to be? Oh, gosh, what meats haven't we done yet? That'll be my first starting point. Okay, mm -hmm. well, here's a, like a series of meats. I'm going to Wikipedia, look up cured meats and different deli meats. Uh, oh, head cheese hasn't been used yet. Interesting. Uh, hairy head cheese. That's funny because that kind of implies a pun. Hairy head, because head cheese is gross to begin with. Have you ever read how it's made? Um, and then, uh, and then plus that kind of can get, give him like a sort of ethnicity, like think about where head cheese was originally originates from and all mm -hmm. that stuff. But then it, it generated this joke because I was reading about head cheese. It's like, it's also called souse. Well, to be soused also means to be drunk. So what if the bar was called souses, which refers to head cheese, which also refers to a place to get soused. Mm. And, uh, and, and th th that's a kind of joke that like not every reader is really going to pick up on. Nobody's going to care necessarily. It's a background joke, but it makes the whole experience more pleasurable because and just doing the research to generate ideas and by creating these kind of these parameters of well, all these characters have to be some kind of a meat and you don't want to repeat meats too often. You don't want everybody to be pork chops. Uh, you know, you don't want everybody to be bacon. Oh, and also a, a story engine uh, construct that we built was that the meats all should have some kind of personality based on the quality of the meat. So corned beef is going to have a different personality than, say, <laughs> bacon. You know, like you have okay. to think about what's the quality. And this is funny, too, because I'm a vegetarian, but... But anyway, you know, like you think about what's the quality of that meat, how does it taste, and uh, what is it associated with? Well, that should inform what the personality of that character is going to be, <laughs> which is, again, it's like creating like an artificial way to uh, generate ideas. And it's not important that the reader knows this, but it's, uh, it's more of a way to sort of logically think about storytelling in order to generate those illogical ideas, if that makes any sense. I don't know if that does. That's I think it does. Happens. I mean, it just to... Uh... Let's see. I really don't want to put a, a blunt point on it, but I really do think that we have this this interplay between being very, uh, very rational, very intentional, and then very creative and emotional. And well, not that cre creative. I don't think is owned that word I, to, for me. I don't feel it's owned by either the uh, the rational part of our experience or the emotional part of our experience. Right. Yeah. Um, because it, it applies to both, both, both of those, uh, modes. Th and that's like saying that like you're either a rational or an emotional person. I mean, mm -hmm. we have, we have tendencies towards one or the other a, a lot of times, but for the most part, a, a, a human being, a human being oscillates between the two or is in constant dialogue between the two. Right. Yeah. And they're well served by both of those things just functioning to contribute to, you know, your your life or whatever. Why is the, why uh, is Pick Wing the uh, a penguin and why is Crunchy the kind of guitar that he is? Speaking of well, your comic, talk about Art Geek Zoo. <laughs> it's uh, well, yeah. I, I, your your research on uh, on the cured meats and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, I've spent a lot of hours on on Wikipedia and whatnot, looking at different um, uh, you know music theory concepts and whatnot. Not having you know gone to a um, a, a music school or anything. Yeah, you decided to do a comic about a music school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I've, n I've never let not knowing stop me from trying. Then that, that's, that's good creativity right there, yeah. And uh, other things I've let stop me from trying, but not knowing isn't one of them. Um, okay, so there's just, yeah, so much of the, the, the you know, music world informing these things in my plot or my characters and whatnot, but actually Pick and Crunchy, uh, sort of the those seed characters as, as far as where, where it all started and the, the main characters and all that. Um, honestly, uh, pick is based off of a, uh, a doodle I did on my folder in high school Damn. that, um, yeah. And I, I just thought it was, he was a fun penguin. He re he, he represented, uh, just 
teenage tough feelings and angst and stuff for me, right? And uh, kind of like it, how if you just looked at uh, Berkeley Breathe's uh, Bill the Cat, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the the big bug eyes and whatnot, there's a lineage there. Um, and I never really read um, Spy versus Spy, but uh, people pointed that out too, the similarities. Yeah. I think that's just kind of a stuff in the back of my head eventually yielding something, right? Mm-hmm. We uh, can't always follow, uh, follow a direct path as far as the lineage of, of, of those ideas. But uh, So in other words, he was just like this thing I drew that I was emotionally attached to. And so when I decided to um, get engaged with publishing a story publicly by playing with this idea of web comics, that then I went, oh, okay, um, I'm going to use this guy I'm familiar with, right? Pick, uh, and and then he he ended up becoming you know Pick Wingve, which is uh, that came after a lot of noodling and brainstorming, right? Because he his his original name was the Constipated Penguin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know cuz that those are that's a t- those are tense feelings <laughs> so anyway uh and so, you so know, for you being a teenager was like akin to being constipated yeah yeah a lot of bottled up emotion constipated yeah, a lot of bottled up <laughs> so uh yeah there you go so uh, you know he, he born up but I'm like that's not going to that's not a fun character name. And, and, and I can separate that. I, I like the idea of him. So whatever yeah. he ended up being pick wing. And then, but crunchy, I just, I always wanted, and I don't own like a flying V guitar. Right. So I play guitar and I have, since I've been, you know, it's probably like 15, 14 or 15. And, um, so I don't know why I just love, um, I suppose it's, yeah, lusting after something an object just thinking like that's a beautiful thing and uh and then i always you know felt emotionally very attached to my guitars right so like i mean a lot of the stuff like i actually probably for the first two years i played um i don't think i took it off that much (laughs) you know like uh when i went to school i took it off (laughs) yeah but yeah it was i don't know what that says about me but anyway um yeah so whatever I wanted a uh, a living guitar character, and uh, but why why give him the personality that you gave him? I mean, um, partially fueled by um, he needed to be he needs he needed to be different, right? I mean, he's he's not a uh, uh, he doesn't have the same life experience as Pick, right? So he's got Pick is going to have some kind of. Uh, you know, emotional challenges to, to deal with yet enjoy guitar or whatever. But then this guitar who, who's going to have a personality will be, you know, possibly at odds with the player. So he's going to be more, more out there with his feelings and, uh, he's much more. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. He, he, there's no filter between him and the world. He just says what's on his mind. Whereas that pick mm-hmm. is much more reserved. And I mean, this is like standard foil building, right? A good buddy story has two characters who are very different uh, and uh, potentially annoying to one another because of that, right? Um, good buddy movie is uh, Midnight Run with Robert De Niro and Charles Grodin. You ever see that? I've heard good things, but I've never seen it. Uh, yeah, not, not for kids. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, <laughs> the language is very intense, but, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's wildly funny and it's, it's, it's a good buddy story where you have, you know, very two different characters kind of, you know, Charles Grodin's character is, um, a family man who is, uh, uncommonly savvy and smart at evading the mob. And, uh, uh, De Niro's character is a cop who is, uh, unjustly kicked off the force and like being a cop was everything he ever cared about so now he's been relegated to being a repo man he's there's a, ba- a guy who chases a bounty hunter right he chases down guys who escape their bail bond or whatever um and bring them back and he hates his job but he's good at it and he's very bitter groden is a character who who's stolen from the mob in order to um oh i forget what he's doing he's doing something to like do some good with the money that he stole from the mob, but now the mob is after him, and now he's being indicted for for 
th stealing from something or other. But in any case, he's like a very idealistic character, but a very clever character too. Um, hmm. But he's also, you know, he's he's uh, he's a family man, so he's like this really kind of like um, uh, milk toast kind of personality. Versus De Niro's very rough and bitter personality. Uh, okay. It's it's fun to watch those two characters interact. The conversations they have in the movie are f more fun than the actual plot of the movie. Um, so anyway, yeah, but that's just like that's good foil building. Is like you just build opposites for one another too, and that's just like another simple rule that is not a rule. I mean, it should be broken if the inspiration strikes you to break it. But at the same time, it's a good starting point to generate ideas for how to have characters interact and how to bring out character out of the, your guys. Right? Absolutely. Um, uh, I think it ties back to the the story engine idea, where you you have the elements that have kind of this interacting energy that that form a pre premise that that produces ideas quite well that, yeah. that that invoke you know the curiosity in the core elements will help people keep coming back to see well what else happens when they end up in this situation or that situation yeah and and these kind of engine ideas I mean this is going back to your idea about starting and mm -hmm. about uh, how it's a soft kind of place it's a place without any kind of distinct borders because engine can evolve and grow and new engines can be built through the process of just making something like mm -hmm. a story i love to tell is jared the abominable the abominable snowman uh main character in the front he became one of the most popular characters of the story and i never expected that i mean he was literally put in as a private joke between me and my wife uh, back in 1999, 1998, I was working on a hard deadline for Antarctic Press. I was working a day job, and I didn't have much time. And so I was not sleeping very much. I was, I was working a graveyard shift, and then during the day, I would be drawing comics. <laughs> and I was, I was crunching on this deadline. I was, I was you know, really tired, really stressed out. And uh, she drew this furry monster on a piece of scratch paper that said, Yo, dudes, guess what? I saw a naked lady once. And she did it just to make me laugh. And uh, I kept that. I still have it to this day. I kept it because it was just this moment where my wife was doing a good, a, 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 something a good friend does, which just reminds you that life is ultimately about, you know, laughing about things. Mm -hmm. And uh, try not to get too serious about this stuff, and I'm going to draw this nonsensical thing. Well, it became a running gag, where every time we go out to dinner together, uh, we get the receipt, you pay with a credit card, and you get the little receipt thing that you sign, and I would always draw that monster acting out his review of the meal. So if he hated it, he was mad, shaking his fists. If, if, if the service was bad, he was punching somebody. If it was really good, then he was, you know, he was cheering and he's dancing with giraffes or whatever. And we have hundreds and hundreds of these receipts that have doodled on over the years. And, uh, and, and, and you know, I never had any intention of doing anything with this character. It was a private joke between me and Anne. Uh, as a matter of fact, his name wasn't even originally Jared. Uh, he, we, we called him Ubby Dubby because we were, uh, he used to, I used to write out, uh, you never heard that, like, it's like a, like a variation on Pig Latin, like Ubby Dubby, where Ubbu Tubbin, Fubbin, Hubby Hubber, you know, you just like replace different syllables with Ub and Dub and you oh, okay. rearrange the, set, the, the word structure that way. So it, it, you sound like you're talking nonsense, but there's actually a logic to it. Kids do it. Um, and so he talked like that. And then, you know, like in one of my early drafts of revisiting the front in 2000, uh, he was going to be called WW and he was going to talk that way. And that didn't make any sense. It, it did not gel with the logic that I was building in the story. So I was like, well, I'm going to scrap that idea. I need to rename this character. What am I going to call this guy? Let's have him talk more like a baby. That'll be cute. Uh, and then I just named him Jared after a kid from a PBS TV show I used to watch where the kids talked ubby dubby. So it was still tied into the private joke, but it was, it was, it evolved and it, 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 so that it was ostensibly logical, but th there was like a, a, a deeper logic that was just between me and Anne. But anyway, so I introduced this character, didn't know that it was going to become, uh, something that people would respond to so well. It was literally just put there just so Anne would read the book, um, but what, what, in where I'm going with this in terms of building internal story logic is through writing the story with him in it, I realized that every scene where I wrote Jared in it, um, I found myself being surprised by what his, because he's, he's with the bad guys. For those who haven't read the story, he's a bad guy, but he's not really bad. He's just mixed up with the wrong crowd. And uh, so every scene I wrote with him, I was kind of forced into this corner of, well, Jared's not bad, but the other guys are bad. How do I write something funny here? How do I come up with a funny situation? And so I wrote all these scenes where Jared 
because of his sweetness and because of his innocence, he makes the bad guys a little less bad. He humanizes them a little bit because for some reason they care about this guy. They're allowing hmm. him to be there. So it made sense that for some reason they must like having him around. And in figuring out that problem, I wrote this rule into the story that Jared's presence with the mercenaries in the front makes them better people. And in the, in the subsequent stories that I'm writing, there's all, all these scenes are growing out of this rule of Jared's there, the problem that the mercenaries have to figure out is how to stay bad guys, but still not despoil this innocent mind. And it becomes three men and a baby, right? You know, where it's like, oh, it's yeah. like we're, we think we're this, but the presence of this new person makes us that. And that's a rule that was not there at the outset. The bad guys were just going to be bad. But I found a new way to approach them as human beings through the introduction of this character who was only put there just as a joke, you know? So like, you, got, you have to be open to surprises too, right? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, what a what a good example for that. It's just uh, you, yeah, being open to discover things. And uh, okay, so start, so many interesting points in there. Uh, obviously, Sorry, I, I was ranting. <laughs> no, no, it, it's it's uh, or rambling. It's a, no, 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 it's, it's a cool story. And uh, yeah, and Jared's a very very cool character. Um, and I think. That, uh, that's what, well, okay. I'll just, I don't have the, uh, the, the next arc of Art Geek Zoo finished, but I've been iterating on ideas, right? And I know that, um, just working on improving as a storyteller, um, I think it's important to find those, maybe, maybe that's what it is. I didn't, I didn't actually use the, the term, uh, story engine, but, but that dynamic to really to improve it and make more clarity in the roles of the characters and in their voice and the ideas that they represent and not to be overly nitpicky about it but but crafting it with that in mind and then seeing what pops out of it and then reacting to it as as a dialogue back and forth with the characters yep. because that's what makes them believable right and uh, that's an area that I'm looking to improve at, at in my storytelling. That um, and and by what you found by using Jared to to grow that right where Jared is like this catalyst for the bad guys that gives them a lot more depth. They're they're just they're not they're just to re represent a negative idea. They actually have other ideas. They they have some caretaking and whatnot in in their in their nature. That um, and that sort of nuance opens up the possibilities for people who consume the story too, right? So a reader will come along and they'll have different impressions on what a bad guy should do and all of a sudden care about what they're, their, their, the choices they're making more than they would normally. And, it's, um, and so essentially that's what I'm working on, discovering, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 by putting yourself into those corners and trying to figure out a problem, you're going to discover new sort of artificial rules to throw in that generate ideas mm -hmm. but you also learn new ways to think about gosh characters but also people like when i think when you think of a bad guy you think okay the, the, the a common idea at least something that occurs to my mind very easily is the batman villain the guy who maybe wasn't all that bad but something bad happens to him and now he's worse Right, mm. and we think about somebody with troubled childhood. Ebenezer Scrooge—he had a rotten childhood. Now he's a rotten human being. Well, that must be it. Must be a troubled childhood, after all. Um, something happened to them when they were at an impressionable age that led them to make bad choices and bad assumptions. By introducing Jared, and especially with the character of Dick, who is my favorite character in the story, um, easily my Mary Sue. He's the character who says and does all the terrible things I would love to be able to do, but I just, all my own inhibitions prevent <laughs> me from doing those things. Um, it forced me to wonder, this is a guy who enjoys being uh, a dastard and a, uh, a scoundrel of whatever, you know. Uh, but why does he enjoy that so much? Uh, did he have a troubled past? Did something rotten happen to him that makes him like relish in this? No, maybe, maybe he thinks he's right. Maybe he has a point of view that is such that he feels intellectually and emotionally justified in behaving that way so that he sees himself, yeah, he's using the word bad, like, oh, I am a bad guy. I don't do goody-goody stuff. 
Uh, but he's using that as sort of like his flag to say, this is my moral high ground. And that would permit him to still be compassionate towards other people because he's mm-hmm. existing in a world where he is intellectually justified his behavior as being somehow morally right. Uh, I didn't approach my characters that way before I introduced Jared into the story. And when I wrote, I rewrote Dick's backstory, which I plan on doing as a story that's going to filter in in, in future stories, um, it surprised me how much more rich the character became because now I was approaching him as a human being where looking at the world through his eyes and trying to really find a way to create a villain who can be compassionate and not have it be arbitrary, right? Oh, yeah, he's bad and he loves to hurt people, but this guy he likes. That's it, you know? Like really mm-hmm. trying to solve problems. I mean, it's all about setting up problems for yourself and then trying to paint, unpaint yourself from the corner. It's uh, it, it's interesting because it, it, I don't know. And so, and so on one hand, it may sound like going through all this effort is uh, you, you know why 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 would you bother coming up with these rules and explanations, right? Because yeah. if someone isn't caring to scratch, scratch the surface, they don't if they don't know that something is really kind of arbitrary or whatever, um, isn't that good enough, right? Yeah. Um. And just to, in, in my impression is, I, I think people actually know. They they, oh, they, they, they can tell. Yeah, they, they do. The you you can you can tell when uh, it's it's the the nuances that make someone you know human, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and even even the bad guys, it's like finding what well, okay what you describe again. That's what I'm working on for the next story arc in Art Geek Zoo, um, which is now the way of sound, right? And uh, it's like trying to love every single character yeah. for who they are. Yep. And let their story let you know be the conductor and the the facilitator of their story without as much judgment, right? And it's and and that's not easy. And but I've discovered that like, oh wow, I think this is the next this is the next rung I need to reach for as a storyteller. Yeah. And um yeah, I mean, yeah, you have to approach them all as human beings and uh, whatever kind of creature they are. And and you were describing earlier a dialogue with them. Um, this is something I try to use as an analogy for how I think about writing stories, uh, <laughs> mostly because I, I, I actually do this, I physically do this, uh, but, in, in, but I don't know if this is too abstract for somebody who's just trying to get under the hood of how to construct something. But it's, it's, it's no different than when you're on the playground as a little kid. And there's other kids pretending to be, you know, I'm, I'm a monkey, I'm a lizard, I'm a, a, a guy with laser cannons for arms. Hmm. And you talk through all the things you're doing because the other kids can't see what you're imagining. So you have to explain that, well, I fire at you with my sonic cannon. Oh, well, I jump out of the way and climb up a tree and I use my deflector shield. And you announce, you telegraph all the things that you're doing because you have to. But you're also interacting with them and you're responding to what these other characters on the playground are doing. And all you're really doing is pretending to be other people on a page and (laughs) letting them do what they got to do and responding to that. It's, it's exactly the same thing as pretending on the playground, but I don't know if that's too, if that's too Tony Robbins, thousand foot view, good feeling way of to describe it because it is a lot of work. (laughs) It's really hard gut wrenching work too. But when it's doing, when it's working right, it, it is as simple as pretending on the playground, right? I I think once you, that's how creative hurdles are, right? I mean, it's like once you've hurdled it, then you look back at it and you're gonna go, oh, okay, I get how I did that. Why yeah. couldn't I have done, have done that before? How can I describe it to other people? And then, sure, you can kind of take a swing at it, but that experience of learning it, it was your your way of you got yeah. through that. You yeah. you gain that knowledge through that way, which might work for other people, might not, whatever. But what I do think is interesting is that if they're curious and they want to hear the, you know, the, the it's like when I was, you know, not, I'm, not even that I have crossed the thresholds like that, but I'm working toward it and I can appreciate them more and more as I get near them. Um, listening to books like, uh, you know, Stephen King's On Writing or um, Natalie Goldberg's uh, Writing Down the Bones, right? You You can appreciate the milestones they're describing 
even though maybe it's not immediately familiar and it's like I haven't crossed that milestone yet. Um, but but yeah, so you I mean your story about the, the the children on the playground and whatnot? It's a if that feels so weird or you know Tony Robbins, which I don't know. Maybe is are you the anti Tony Robbins? Because like you know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could play off that because I yeah that, um, you'd have to smile more and have uh, babes in bathing suits next to you. Which <laughs> sorry to disappoint you if you check out the video after I say that there isn't. Yeah, <laughs> my teeth aren't that white and uh, and I'm not that that much of a showman, but I'm working on it. But if you swing your, you could bust out some push ups. <laughs> <you know? laughs> well, <laughs> you, know, you know, well, I was just saying that like you know when you t- when you encapsulate an idea like that, it comes off as commoditized kind of inspirational packets. You know, uh, sure. for $2 a month, I'll give you these little thoughts that will inspire you to do such and such. When that's really not the point. The point is, is try, it's like, for me, it's, it's, like, it's advice that people say all the time. It's like, oh, in the comics industry, there's no one door in. It's a million different doors, and everybody has to find their own mm-hmm. door in. So no path is an example of how to get in, because there's so many different ways to get in, and everybody's path is unique, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, if that's the case, then... Talking about how to break in makes no sense. There's no purpose to it whatsoever. If everybody has to find their own way. So what can we talk about? We can talk about how we think about it. What is our, the way our thinking changes? What is the kind of changes that happen in us creatively as we try to break in? Uh, how did we solve each and every one of those problems? Not specifically, you know, well, I just use these kinds of analytics and I use this kind of stats package and boom, I'm successful. No, there has to be a way that you think about it that is universal to other people, regardless of the methods that they used. That's the mm-hmm. interesting thing. So trying to use analogy, but that, that's a difficult thing to describe, right? It's how do you explain your thinking? Mm-hmm. So you do it through analogy. So for me, it always comes back to getting in touch with that youthful kind of sense of, and this is the kind of stories I like to tell. If I'm going to tell stories about Henry portrait of a serial killer, uh, maybe I don't need to get in touch with that eight-year-old. Well, maybe I could. I don't know. But, you know, depending, it, it depends on what kind of story you want to tell. It depends on your disposition as a person. I'm the kind of person who sees a kid with a unicorn backpack and get in aches with sadness that I can't be a child again. Other people may think that, no, man, I wouldn't go back to that for a million dollars. Like, for instance, there's people who look at, you know, the, their high school years as being this glorious time of, of happiness and excitement. There's no amount of money you could give me to make me go be 15 again. Never, ever, ever, ever. That, that, was, a, mm-hmm. that was a very bleak time. I was filled with constipation. <laughs> <laughs> it was horrible. I wouldn't go back to that for anything. I wouldn't go back to 20 for anything. I, I love being in my 30s. This is a great, great time. But... If I had my choice, eight all the way. That was a great time because I wasn't mm-hmm. worried about all this other stuff. But um, it was a lot worse when I was 15. But, you know, so what I'm saying is that the specifics don't matter. The The analogies are just there to sort of drive you at the thinking process is where I'm trying to go with that. And, and yeah, so, they're not prescriptions. They're, they're, um, not. they're, they're general pointers, and they're, they help you um, try to build a shared understanding and experience. Right. right? And you know what? 90% of the people who made it this far through the podcast know that, you know. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but, that's, but that's it, true. I guess too. it doesn't hurt to 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 inculcate just to like sort of to try to drive home this point of like this is seriously what we're not trying to do here. But anyway, but so did I get anywhere near where your curiosity lied on that in terms of like starting something? Uh, I think it went to a very interesting place. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, very very <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> no, but it was interesting. <laughs> It, uh, oh, well, right. Well, you described the, the challenges of groupthink, essentially, right? And, uh, man, I, I, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, you know. So, mm-hmm. let's see, you were talking about working through, um, oh, what was the example at the time? But the, the creative process and taking in all the different, you know, uh, external input and stuff, whatever. And, and yeah, I live that world in, in, in doing UI design and user experience. Yeah. And uh, so... Whatever, and I knew you'd pick up on that joke. But anyway, the uh, uh, it's no, it's not that that exact. That's not the point, though. Also, right? So, yeah. no, but that wasn't the point. I think it's it was. Um, I'm here to discover too, right? And yeah. and uh, it's fun that we really nailed the idea that starting is gray. Starting isn't a procedure and a particular boundary i mean there yeah. may be a, a point during iteration and incubating an idea that it crosses a threshold where now your investment in it is greater right yeah and you're looking to now 
commit to something to deliver, right? Yeah. But actually starting, it's 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 a it's it's, it's a flexible mode, right? Yeah. That involves a lot of different things. And and if there's any headlines to take away is that for me, and this goes for whether I'm doing something contractually for a client or whether I'm working for myself, is it all comes down to working within parameters, establishing arbitrary parameters for myself or looking at the client's input as a series of parameters to operate within. Mm -hmm. And uh, that does not diminish creativity in my opinion. Uh, it's about uh, trying to be as creative as possible with the limited set of tools or, or, con or the set of restrictions that are being placed upon you. Uh, does it always work? No. I mean, there are projects that I've done where I look at it. I have one drawing, and i got to find it. It's someplace in one of my, my portfolios um, where client input continuously changed the, the illustration to the point where it's the one drawing I've ever done that actually frightens me. When I look at it, I feel uncomfortable because it's so scary. They, they, they had me make this kid 10% happier, 10% happier, 10% happier until he's so deliriously, monstrously happy that it looks frightening. And I can't believe that illustration was plastered all over uh, public transit buses for a couple months uh, and, and printed on the back of a comic book for a while. Uh, and I saved it. For, I, I threw out a whole bunch of those drawings because I just didn't care about them anymore. Just recycle them. But that one, when I found it, I was like, oh, oh God. Oh, that's so, that's so frightening. You know, I, I, I got to keep this. The face of true fear. <laughs> <laughs> you want to keep it. It's... It's delirious. I mean, that's it's funny. it's really it looks sounds derailed. like madness, maybe like looking yeah. into madness kind of thing. It, that's that's how it feels when I look at it. It's so frightening. But um, but so that's an example that I like to hang on to of saying like, okay, you know, working within parameters sometimes can take you down some dark roads. But uh, for the most part, ninety nine percent of the time, for me, thinking about parameters as being tools to inspire creativity. Uh, is is super super useful, and that that's a way to like sort of make client work a little bit more enjoyable. It's like how can I make them? How can I reach the goal that they're setting in front of me? Uh, not, not fight them on that. I know story. You don't know story. You listen to me. No, my job at that point is to say, wow, they really want something strange here. Uh, how can I make this good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and do it in a way where they're going to know it's good, but they're not going to necessarily be privy to all the mechanics that went into making it good, right? Because they just want a product. Yeah, your response to that, it, it's input, right? And your response doesn't have to be a, the result of a simple equation. It would be, you know, pretty yeah. subtle. Like you asking me, hey, did, it, did we hit that yeah. topic? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, but... It's, that, that's uh, that's me looking for reassurance that I didn't just waste everybody's time, right? No. I mean, that's totally why you ask a question like that. Did I even get close to that? You know? Self indulgently, actually, I thought it, I thought it was cool where the the direction we took it because actually now I'm feeling especially this this summary exercise is, is interesting too because there was other um, part of the whole point for for starting is you're finishing at yeah. something, right? Yeah. And those limitations that give you some fun experience while you're actually going past that line of where you've committed, you've started, uh, there probably are going to be the very things that help you complete it. Not always, because as you mentioned, I mean, some things, if you're driven by constant feedback, the, you know, without other limitations, you may never finish. Oh man, um, this is a big one. This is a big one I've been thinking about a lot is... Uh, so you turned me on to the 5 by 5 Network of Podcasts, and there was an episode of Back to Work mm. where they were talking, and I listened to this, I told you already off mic, this episode, I've listened to the latest episode as of the week of, oh gosh, I don't even know what number it was. Could you look oh, it up, Rob? Like, because I think it's I am. it's like tw 27 or so, I think. Um, I listened to it three times because it was such a... a no, rich, sorry, 31. Episode 31. Episode 31 of Back to Work. We'll link to it in the show notes, but... Uh, they're talking about people always going after the thumbs up. You know, you got to go. You always got to get that thumbs up because if somebody gives you a thumbs down, you've lost the conversation with them forever. And like they're saying, like uh, the the guest on Merlin's show was saying, I don't really care about getting a thumbs up. And I was thinking about how when I was updating the front online as a web comic in 2003, and I had 50 people visiting the website on a regular basis. What kept me going? I wasn't getting emails all the time. I wasn't. There was no Twitter. I wasn't getting constant reassurance of good job. You did it. Uh, all I had to keep me going was my commitment to the thing and my satisfaction of doing the thing. And that's something I need to get back to. That's something I really need 
to reinforce in my life and it comes back around to this idea that we were talking about before we did the show which maybe we can shelve for a future discussion mm-hmm. is this idea of commitment to an audience and uh, maintaining your own sense of creative satisfaction regardless of audience that's not to say not to dishonor an audience not to to give an audience the finger and say I don't care about you but maintaining a boundary in why you're doing what you're doing so that you don't get hooked hooked on that constant cycle of did I get that did, did somebody hit the like button did somebody plus one it did somebody retweet it or whatever because that is that that is a poisonous cycle I think uh, to get caught in that and, it, and it, it distracts you from why you're doing what you're doing which is why people are plus wanting it in the first place <laughs> <laughs> yeah it really does have those uh it, it sounds like they're they're opposite ideas but it's very much related to to be authentic and and clearly expressing yourself which i mean man i'm saying this but this is something i try to live up to as best i can but but i'm, I'm learning as as i'm going here oh yeah um but the um <clears throat> expressing yourself to entertain an audience you want to see that that res- that response or you want to see them get accomplished, whatever they wanted to. Why, what I, why what I, ever you're sharing that thing, right? So right. is it a screencast to help someone code, or is it um, a comic that's an adventure, or for laughter or drama, whatever? You want to get that r- response because mm-hmm. it's part of the the human exchange. And yeah, the, we've got the efficient thumbs up, thumbs down things, whatever. But if you're only driven by that there's probably going to be a, a numbing and a disconnection eventually that somehow leads you to being less able to keep producing it because you're not able to to you know reconnect with your story engine you've kind of corrupted the engine by mm-hmm. um let's see i guess uh, to use it as an analogy you're no longer fueling it with uh the the right source anymore you're trying to to run it off of something that it just yeah. that can't keep it going yep that's a good way. That's a good analogy for it. But I think that this one needs to be dug into deeper. Uh, oh we'll, yeah, we'll show it for another time because we're coming up on probably what should be the end. Uh, mm-hmm. Going for a little about an hour or so. Okay. Uh, so we didn't answer the question, but we went in interesting places, and that's as it should be. It's not about finding an answer. It's about uh, wandering around and looking at things, going, "Isn't that interesting?" It's right? such a better way to put what I said <laughs> to your <laughs> reply hey did we did we achieve that we did what we yeah we explored it that, that was that yeah. was the worthwhile thing we went we wandered around we kicked over some rocks we looked at some different leaves and said wow that's kind of cool and then we went back home <laughs> was a good day <laughs> all right so um hey we should point people at the uh 30 30 thing that we're doing um if you enjoyed this conversation, if you think that our thoughts are worth thinking about, or if we lead you in directions that you like thinking, uh, you should check out 30classes30days.com, or it's at leanintoart.com in the, the menu bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're putting on a show, putting on a big event uh, in November, uh, where there's going to be an online workshop presentation every day for the month of November. We brought in a whole bunch of really great teaching artists to do this with us, and... Um, Early bird registration ends in a couple weeks. So your chance to get in for uh, cheap will come to a close soon. So you should go there, and if you are interested, you should register now. Uh, because after September 23rd, prices are going to go up. Prices are clearly marked on there. You can see what you can expect to pay after September 23rd, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, what did we call it? Uh, the Online Art Center for Visual Storytellers. Yeah, that's what Lean Into Art is in general. And then this whole event really celebrates that and, and, and kicks us off with a bit of a bang because yeah. we're, we're here to, uh, to, to do this to, to serve you, right? Big online unconference where we're going to do a lot of really cool interactive uh, workshops to wander around these ideas in a compelling and meaningful way where you will have something to show for your time. So... Uh, and when you do the math, it's actually pretty cheap to participate compared to what you'd pay for a local art center or even what we're going to be charging for classes after 3030. Mm-hmm. So. Which those are very fair as well, of course. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. But, uh, but even so, it's, it is like a big super deal kind of bundle, right? Yep. And uh, uh, so what would be an example, Jersey, of something that uh, someone could enjoy? 
throughout okay. the month. Good question. So uh, one of the things I plan on doing is a Photoshop course, like teaching my m method of coloring in Adobe Photoshop or and Adobe Photoshop Elements so that mm -hmm. uh, right after the class, you'll have uh, a page of illustration artwork that you have started that you can continue and finish. Um, but that will be going step by step where you follow along. And if you have any questions, you can stop me and, you know, it'll be fully interactive so you can follow along and uh, get actual hands-on help from the instructor. It's not just about watching an instructional video where follow these steps. If somebody has an interesting question about another way to handle it, I can show you that because you told me you, that you're interested in that. Well, isn't there another way to go about that? Yes, indeed. Here's another way to go about it, right? Because there's like 20 different ways to do everything in Photoshop. There's a million ways to do everything in any kind of visual storytelling. Um, I'm going to be bringing my Comics Fundamentals course to this thing, which will be a multi-part session where it will be an interactive class where it will be a soup-to-nuts approach of exploring how to build a comic story, at least from my point of view. The, the ways I've used to thinking strategies, ways to generate story engine for yourself, ways to think about character setting, plot, ways to think about uh, the, the composition of the page and how that interacts with the three layers of visual rhythm of uh, panel, panel content, and sound in a comic. A lot, a lot of deep stuff we'll be digging into with that. Again, very interactive, so if somebody wants to lead me off course and take me down some interesting roads, we can go there. Um, and then, these will be recorded after the facts. You can always review them, watch them again after you've participated in the class. And there's going to be a forum where you can participate with the work that you do. You can put it in the forum and get... Uh, reactions from the other users as well as the instructors and we're even going to be doing some public uh if, if you are interested in, in contributing to the public uh gallery showcase yeah yeah showcase you can show off the work that you completed this course will be a little bit of way to like let the world know what you're doing so lots and lots of rich stuff that we're going to be doing through this thing it's gonna be a lot of work <laughs> oh man it's gonna be an intense but really fun month i mean we would really uh i mean it's it's a it's in a way it's going to be a little bit of a reality show too, where we're going to put ourselves through the ringer for this event. We want it to be awesome and fun and engaging and have a lot of uh, a great experience for the teachers involved and for all the students that sign up as well. Uh, it's just going to be a really fun way to, to kick off our online art center for visual storytellers. But uh, one, one thing that hit me when you're describing your class jersey is that this would be a heck of a way to, to really sort of to, uh, to kick off or reinvigorate um, like a comic project, you know, so you're working on your comic and you want to just soak in a whole bunch of really interesting, helpful information from a, a lot of different creative people. Right. This would be a, an excellent way to go about that. Yep. And there's little activities that I will um, in, pepper in for like homework activities. Like one of the things I do in my comics fundamentals course when I do it in person is I send off the students to go out, go for a walk, do not think about anything, just go for a walk for the pure pleasure of going for a walk and take your digital camera and anytime you see something interesting, grab it, capture that. It, I'm not going to say what it has to be. I'm not saying where you have to go for a walk. You don't have to go, you can go to a park, you can go to a beach, you can go to the shopping mall, wherever you are relaxed and grab images of things that you think when you look at it, you go, neat. And then we review them as a class. We look at the pictures everybody took and we analyze. And we say, well, and we discover things about ourselves as storytellers. Like one of my students, one of my favorite stories to tell is the student brought in all these pictures where everything was a picture of something in the distance that was framed by things in the foreground. I said, wow, depth is really important to you and framing your images is super important to you. Were you thinking about that when you took these pictures? No, I just thought it looked cool. Oh, well, now you have something that is in your visual vocabulary that you can be more cognizant of when you're building your stories is how can I introduce depth? How can I frame this shot more interestingly? And her storytelling improved a lot and her framing is fantastic now because that one little thinking exercise that, that just sparked a, a very deep intentionality in the way she approaches her storytelling. So there's stuff like that too. It's not just about like sit down everybody and shut up. I'm going to tell you about some things that you should know about comics. It comes. sounds like the opposite of that. Yeah. With the, that kind of interactive feedback is, yeah. is, uh, is helpful for anyone who's going through a creative experience. Yeah, I think so. So yeah, it, it'll be worth it. It's going to be a really fun thing. And I hope you guys will come along for the ride. Uh, we can't do it without support, uh, because this is going to be an expensive project to put on. And, uh, so we hope that you'll, uh, Chip in by becoming either, they've got three tiers. You can participate via just, uh, what, what are the three tiers, Rob? Yeah, so we access? have, um, we have uh, yeah. bronze, silver, and gold. 
And uh, that's right. So essentially, everyone gets four access, and then Bronze also gets uh, fifteen of the time shifted workshops. So one of the the things that we will be doing in our normal operation is offering both live experiences like Jersey described, and also things that are more time-shifted. So they have a live element to it, possibly, through uh, forum interaction and whatnot. You may be having a dialogue back and forth, but it's not the same thing as far as being on camera or uh, annotating a screenshot right with each other. It's not the same thing, but uh, you will get a lot of info at the bronze level. Um, and then the, the silver level, it's, it's essentially... Um, the uh, a lot like gold except it's not live right where you get not no. just 15 you get all 30 so you you'll be a part of all 30 days and then for gold it's everything in some ways i mean you'll be a part of that live audience interactive experience and it'll be um it'll be like being a part of uh the live crowd at a um I want to say like a like a show taping it's more it's not just that because you're you're participating so what it's it's a lot yeah, like man. if you were on a, a like a really like a fun classroom public television style show, right? There and you uh, you'll be a part of it, and so that'll get uh, recorded for gold members as well. But yep, yeah, they get to be there and part of things. Uh, there's ten live workshops, fifteen uh, time shifted workshops, and then five labs or roundtables, right? Yeah. Where we're, we're essentially. Uh, we'll have a, a teacher present and uh, um, a support person uh, for the school that will be facilitating a bit of a class, but it's sort of a, a very ad hoc, what questions do people have? The instructor may have like a, a kickoff exercise or what have you to, to uh, break the ice, but then it's really going to be a, a heavily interactive live the tra lab. Traditional sense of the lab. Yeah. Yeah. Classes, 30days.com, or at leanintoart.com and click the 30 classes in 30 days link. Uh, I just got notified that I'm running out of disk space, Rob. <laughs> so we, we got to wrap up okay. whether I like well. it or not. Um, I didn't realize I was so short on disk space. I'm going to have to look into that. So, okay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, everybody, for downloading. Uh, go, you, you could help out the show a lot by giving us an iTunes star review, or you could tell a friend about Lean Into Art. It's on the Twitters. Lean Into Art on Twitter. Um, for more n news from us, we're going to be posting some polls for you to interact with soon. We're, we're already started, so pay attention to the Twitter feed for more mm -hmm. on that, or just go to leanatire.com as often as you like and tell everybody that you know that, that you, they should be looking at this thing too. We super appreciate it. We do. Uh, okay, well, hey, good time and intervention, Rob. Yeah, good luck, Jersey, Thanks. at SPX. And uh, until next time, I've been Jersey Droz of comicsgreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I'm Rob Stenzinger at, uh, you can find me at uh, robstenzinger.posterist.com is my blog. And I'm Rob okay, Stenzinger on the Twitter. And stop this. That yeah. disc.